we have lots going on here today, and it's starting with our sourdough. So it is 10.30 in the morning. Um, I started some sourdough yesterday, and I have to get it in the oven now today. So sourdough is a really long process, anybody that knows about sourdough. I'm no expert, not at all. I just got back into sourdough again, so this is certainly not a how-to video. Um, on how to do sourdough properly. I don't know what this is gonna look like. This has been proofing all night in the fridge, but we're gonna take a look together. So to proof it, I use these Banatons, Banaton baskets, and I just cover it with a, um, just an old cloth. I mean, these cloths have lots of holes in them. They're just basically for this type of thing. And I use garbage bags. I got them cut off, they're clear bags. Um, in our neck of the woods, it's a requirement that our garbage goes in clear bags. We're not allowed to use those black and green bags anymore. So I know that's not everywhere, but that's why we have clear garbage bags. So there's a lot of moisture inside of it, so I'll just turn it inside out. And I usually like put one over my Berkey and just kind of put one wherever I can to let it dry off so I can reuse it, because you know I'm not gonna let this go to waste. So we'll get that drying. All right, so we did two sourdough recipes yesterday. I did my regular double batch of my regular sourdough bread. So that makes two loaves. And I did a cinnamon raisin sourdough bread. Never done that recipe before. That's brand new to me, so I don't know how it's gonna turn out. We'll see. I hope it's good, because I love cinnamon raisin bread. And I love sourdough, so there you go. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get started on this. The oven is preheating, or it's preheated with the um, Dutch ovens in there because you want your sourdough to go into hot Dutch ovens. So I have those in there. They've been in there for probably maybe about 40 minutes. They say keep it in for an hour. I really never do, I gotta be honest. Like, as long as they're good and hot, I'm happy. But we'll get these out and get them scored and get them cooking. And I have a bunch of other projects on the go today. I am going to be, um, I have to make a batch of elderberry syrup because we're all out. So I'm gonna get that going kind of in the background. Um, I have eggs to wash. I don't know, you can see the red uh, feed scoops back there full of eggs. We have quite a bit of eggs. So we don't wash all our eggs. Um, if they're clean, we just put them away. You can leave them on a counter. We leave them out for quite a while until, you know, we let them stockpile before we put them away because um, clean eggs are fine, fresh eggs, uh, without being washed because they have a natural bloom on them and that protects the egg from spoiling. Uh, that natural bloom is in place because when a chicken goes to, you know, a, a hen goes to sit on her eggs to hatch them out, well, it's 21 days to hatch time, so, um, that egg is naturally protected with that bloom to keep bacteria from going into it to uh, protect the growing chick inside. So just, you know, little fact there in case you're wondering. Um, so yeah, I have to get my eggs washed. Um, I've just got a bunch of little projects today and this is not going to be on today's video, but I have a little bag of uh, organic turmeric here. And I just noticed that two of them have little sprouts coming from them. So I have to find some good appropriate pots for these and we're gonna plant some turmeric on our next video. Um, it's a little bit, it's not really the ideal time of the year. For, for growing turmeric, you need about eight to 10 months of really hot weather. It's a tropical plant, right? But you can grow it in your greenhouse so for here where I'm at in a northern growing area, um, we could plant this inside as long as you're, where you're putting it is fairly warm, um, probably like January or so. And then when spring comes, you can put it in your greenhouse and you know we can successfully grow turmeric. Um, so yeah, I just noticed these are organic and they're sprouting. So we are going to get those planted next video. I just had to find a proper pot. You need a pot that's deep enough and big enough for the spread and stuff with good drainage. So yeah, I gotta figure that out because we're gonna try it. 
but let's get started on the sourdough. And I didn't say, I'm Jen. Welcome to our homestead. I am one half of Savory and Sage Homestead. My husband Lance is also part of this team, but he is not here today. He's out running some errands, working on the barn, doing all the things. So I am going to get this done. Let's get started. So I'm not going to go into the exact specifics of the recipes I use, but I will just give you a general idea of how I made this dough yesterday. So the first thing I did was combine the flour and the water from the recipe to make what's called an auto lease. So you let that sit for about 30 minutes and it just kind of helps the flour absorb the water. So to this auto lease, you're going to add your fed and active sourdough starter and your salt. Um, I usually use a kitchen scale to measure all the ingredients because it's very precise to get a good sourdough bread. So once I had that really well incorporated, I just covered it for about 30 minutes and then I started what's called um, stretch and folds. So most sourdough recipes, or pretty much all of them, call for a period of stretch and folds. So generally speaking, that's anywhere from two to three hour process um, where you take the dough and you stretch and fold it four times upon itself um, at different intervals. So I did, you know, three sets of stretch and folds every 15 minutes and then I did three sets of stretch and folds every 30 minutes. So once I finished all my stretch and folds, I just covered it up again and put it aside and let it bulk ferment. Um, just on the counter, it can take anywhere from 6 to 12 hours depending on the temperature of your house but um, you're just gonna bulk ferment it until it doubles. After that, I this one particular recipe was a double recipe, so for that one, I actually split the dough apart and then I shaped my dough and put it into the banneton, and that's where you're gonna long ferment overnight in the fridge. That's more of a cold fermentation. Um, you can put it in the fridge for up to 12 to 15 hours. All right, we'll start with our regular bread. I have to find my razor blade for scoring this. So this is not my sourdough recipe, not a chance. I'm certainly no expert, like I said. So uh, this is from Farmhouse on Boone, actually. This is her no need sourdough recipe. I will link that in the description to give credit where credit is definitely due. She has amazing sourdough um, videos. So I used an on bleach parchment. So just a little trick if you, to keep your parchment from curling, you know, the ends from curling up, if you scrunch it up first um, and then lay it out, it doesn't have those curly ends anymore. So I'm gonna double this over because I don't think this piece is gonna be big enough actually. I'm going to use this one for my other bread because that's not big enough. This piece is probably too big, but that's okay. I double mine over. My oven is really hot. Um, in fact, this particular recipe, um, she cooks it for on 500 to start. I can't get my oven to 500, um, or I can but it burns this. So I've kind of had to do a little bit of a modification. So I decrease the temperatures a little bit. I double my parchment and I put a tray underneath my, um, my Dutch ovens. So we're just going to tip this out. And you don't want to disturb your dough because you don't want to uh, deflate all those good bubbles in the sourdough that have been proofing all night. So I'm just going to take a little bit of flour and just kind of lightly dust it. You don't have to do this. It's said to just make the pattern come out a little better. I forget this step all the time. Don't worry about it. It's not going to make your bread taste any different. So now, like I said, this is not a how-to video. I am not an expert scorer. I don't do fancy patterns. I wish I could, but I do not. So, um, I'm going to do just go straight down the middle. So you use a razor blade because it um, just cuts really well. 
And this is just for expansion of the bread. So actually I'll go this way. All right. Now, some people get really fancy with this. I mean, maybe someday I will, but I'm sure some sourdough experts are looking at this now saying, oh my God. The cuts aren't even. All right, I'm gonna go through the middle again one more time. You don't have to, that's just my choice. All right, so that one is ready to go in the Dutch oven. I'm just gonna put that aside and I'm gonna take out my raisin bread there now. This one looks like it's proofed up a lot. These are just narrow bannetons that I bought, like oval ones. Oh, look at that. Oh, I hope that turns out good. I hope it tastes as good as it looks. Oh, that is beautiful. Wow. We're gonna do the same, just sprinkle with a bit of flour. I might've put too much on, but that's all right. Now for this one, I don't know. Maybe I'll just come right down the center. I think I'll just do just some basic slices on the side like that. All right, let's get these in their Dutch ovens and get them cooking. Just realized I didn't have the camera on. So I basically just dropped that down into that Dutch oven. Oh, that's really hot. I really need new oven mitts. <laughs> these uh, Dutch ovens are extremely hot when they're preheating for a long time. So this is the other one that I use for my oval shaped um, sourdoughs. That's beautiful. All right, let's close that up and we'll get them in the oven. Now I just put a um, cookie sheet on the bottom tray there. I don't know if it actually helps, but my bread doesn't seem to be burning as much on the bottom now. So I put one there. This one is really awkward to get in because it actually has like little legs on it and it's not really meant to go in an oven. It's more of a fire pit uh, Dutch oven. There we go. All right, so we bake that for, um, this is the modified temperature that I use for my oven because my oven just runs really hot or something. It's just, I guess the temperature's off. It's a brand new oven. So I'm trying to get used to it, but I find 475 for the first 20 minutes with the covers on the Dutch ovens works well. Then we take the covers off. I decrease it to 450 and another 25 minutes. I have had to take them out sometimes between 20 and 25 minutes for the second uh, portion of the cook time. So the other thing that's on my agenda today that I forgot to mention that I will be doing is I will be doing some more freeze dried potatoes. These things are awesome. We did these, um, I don't know, a few weeks ago, but look at them. They're just like um, little pieces of super light styrofoam. I don't know if you can hear that. But it's just like little pieces of styrofoam. I left the peels on. They're actually delicious. So when peel just fell off on the floor. When you rehydrate them, we did test them. Um, we were going to do a test on video. And we will. I think we're going to do like a, a freeze-dried... Um, video someday where we rehydrate like a few different things 
but we did try these the other day and when you first rehydrate them they seem kind of like they might have a little bit of a weird consistency they're just like a really well cooked potato when you rehydrate them but then you throw them in the frying pan and saute them like a hash brown and put a bit of salt on them they are delicious um really really good so i'm definitely going to do more of those i have a bunch of potatoes there I have some of our own potatoes, but I'm gonna save those for fresh eating. And I have a bag that I bought from the farmer's market. I'm gonna finish off those. That's the same ones that are in this jar. Um, but I'm gonna do those today. So we have to blanch them and get them in the freeze dryer. So we're gonna do that together. So before I start washing and cutting and blanching my potatoes for the freeze dryer, I'm gonna get my elderberry syrup going in the background here. All right, I'm not gonna get into the specific amounts of each ingredient that I put in here because I do have a video on this that I will link, um, but I'll also put the recipe down in the description if you are interested. escape a little bit so I don't get burned. Oh, they are looking beautiful. Look how gorgeous that is. Just a quick sneak peek. I don't want to lose too much heat in my oven. It is getting really hot in here. So it looks like a really nice day outside actually. But with the oven going, with the sourdough at such a high temperature, and the wood stove was on this morning because it was cold, I just had to open the window. I'm really hot. Whew. So I gotta reseal my um, jar of freeze-dried potatoes. So I just thought I'd show you this nifty little thing that I got. Um, it creates a little bit of a vacuum in your jars. Uh, it's not like a, a food preservation method as far as um, you know, comparable to canning or anything like that. It's just an extra little um, precaution, I guess, because what, you know, we don't want any oxygen or as little oxygen as possible in with our freeze dried stuff because, um, you know, just to minimize the risk of spoilage. So I got this little concoction. It works pretty good, generally speaking. I will still put a ring on these though because it's not a guaranteed seal. Like, they have broken, so, um, and when it breaks, then there's moisture getting in your jar into your freeze-dried stuff. So same with dehydration, same kind of thing. So I will put a ring just to be extra secure. But basically, you put this little rubber cap over the jar, and this is like a little vacuum machine. It's rechargeable, and it just sucks the air out of it. I think the battery is getting a bit low on this right now, so I hope it works, but it should. I saw another YouTuber use this and I thought it was cool so I ordered it and it actually works pretty good. Stop that from making noise. So you just pop that back off and it is sealed there now. So and the center is sunk down so it has drawn the air out of it but I will put a ring on just for precaution. I don't put rings on my canned goods because that's a whole different um, thing. But for this kind of stuff, I do just for the extra security. So I got that done. So I'm gonna give these potatoes a scrub and um, get the dog hair off of them first. We have a husky. Any husky owners out there that have a husky in the house knows what I'm talking about when I say dog hair. There's, you could vacuum and five minutes later, there's tufts of dog hair around again but she's a pretty girl and an awesome girl, so what do you do? So I get these scrubbed up and I don't think I need to peel them again. I think they should scrub well. They're still relatively new and we'll get them diced and blanched and in the freeze dryer. Guess I better pay attention to things. Hey, just notice this is like bubbling here. So I'm gonna give this a little stir. 
turn it down a little bit. We don't want it like rapidly boiling, just a little simmer. And there we go. All right, let's get them scrubbed. So you can use a brush or whatever you want. I have one of these little scrubby cloths that one of my friends gave me and it works pretty well. So kind of just like that. So I'll get the rest of these done and then we'll get them going. All right, we're gonna get this out of the oven. So the second cook was only 20 minutes as well because I can smell it burning a little bit. How gorgeous that is. Oops. All right, I have to show you my breads. This is two of them. One is still in the oven. So this is the regular sourdough. Look how beautiful that is. That's probably the prettiest one I've ever done. I gotta be honest. And this is the cinnamon raisin one. So this one's a lot darker because of the cinnamon in it. It's really hot still. Not as pretty as the other one, but it looks delicious. I cannot wait to dig into the cinnamon raisin one. I think it's gonna be great. All right, so I gotta strain my elderberry syrup because that's done. Strain that off. Then I'm gonna get out my potatoes. Got them all scrubbed up and we're gonna get those all diced. I might just put them in water for now, just to soak for a while, get some of the starch out and maybe get a coffee because I'm feeling like I need it. So yeah, but these are just gorgeous. I'm so happy with those. I'm not sure if I'll have enough potatoes to fill the freeze dryer trays, but if I don't, I might try something else with it. One of the things I wanted to try um, in the freeze dryer was pureed parsnip. So we have a lot of parsnips still in our garden and I wanna get them out before it freezes really hard. They've had several frosts now, so that sweetens them up in the ground. If anybody doesn't realize that, leave your parsnips in the ground until after a frost, if you're in a cold area. And um, I mean, we can leave them there all year, all winter and eat them in the spring, but I don't really wanna do that. Um, so we love pureed parsnips. Um, it's really yummy with cream and butter and just delicious. So I thought we might be able to do that in the freeze dryer. You can freeze dry mashed potatoes. Um, so I don't see why you couldn't do a pureed parsnip and freeze dry it. So we're going to do a test and see what that would turn out like. We wouldn't put the cream or the butter in until afterwards, right? So I think it'll work out. I don't know. I haven't seen anybody do it. Um, I've been kind of looking to see if there was any videos on it or anything like that, but I haven't really seen anything that I could find. Now, I didn't look that hard, but um, so I may just take a handful of parsnips and just do one tray and um, see how it goes. So I might actually do that today with this and uh, test it out. Why not? All right, I have parsnips. So I didn't get a lot because I, this is just a trial in the freeze dryer. So I have, you know, like they're a decent size. That garden that I have the parsnips in this year isn't the best garden for root crops like carrots and parsnips that like really deep bedding. Actually, it's I shouldn't say that, it's a pretty deep bed there, but it's, the fertility is lacking a little bit. So I am moving all that for next year. I actually did some of my carrots in a different bed this year and they did much better. So parsnips will go up with those next year. So, but we got a lot of parsnips. Like I had really good germination with my parsnips this year. So, um, and I was really good at thinning them out. So we have a lot. Um, so we're gonna get them scrubbed up and cook them up and puree them and get them on the freeze dryer. And I have all the potatoes done. They're all chunked and I'm gonna rinse them, blanch them and in the freeze dryer as well. 
So let's get started. I don't peel parsnips that come fresh out of the ground like this, not a chance. Just like any root vegetable, it really doesn't need it. Just needs a good scrub. Look how pretty that is. All right, so we'll get them all done and uh, we'll steam them, I think. I actually don't think I'm gonna get my eggs washed today, so I think that's gonna have to wait another day. I uh, kind of running out of time. I have some things to do tonight. I have to get some work done on the herbalist course I'm doing. Sometimes it's hard to get motivated when you're doing all kinds of other things, but I have to devote some time to that, so. <laughs> We'll get this all done and in the freeze dryer and I'm gonna call it a work day in the kitchen. I have leftovers for supper from yesterday. I made a wonderful um, chicken pot pie with biscuit topping yesterday for supper. It's delicious. Hope this turns out good. I hate to waste good parsnips. Honestly, it'd have to taste pretty bad for us not to eat it. We'll find a use for it, no matter what. All right, parsnips are all ready to go. So we're gonna steam those until they're nice and fork tender. All right, I think they are well done. Very fork tender. It didn't take long at all to steam those. So normally when we do it, we do it with an immersion blender with butter and cream, but because I'm not adding butter and cream, I think I'm gonna try it in the food processor. Let's see how this goes. I think that's nicely pureed. Ooh, I'm excited about this one. So once I had the parsnips all pureed, I just spread the parsnip puree onto the freeze dryer trays. You can see how hot this still is. I don't know why I didn't let it cool a bit, but it is what it is. So I got one tray of pureed parsnip and then I moved on to my diced potatoes that I had uh, blanched first. So I had them blanched and rinsed and I got three trays of diced potatoes to go in the freeze dryer as well. So in the freeze dryer unit they went and I think they were on I want to say around 30 hours but I never time it. I keep forgetting to look at the timer when I take them out. I gotta be honest and I probably should get better at that because I know that would be a little bit beneficial especially for videos. But nonetheless, once they came out of the freeze dryer, they were all good. The potatoes went into storage and um, just as they did before, and they're gonna make some yummy, yummy taters in the future, um, or hash browns, I guess we'll call them. That's probably a better description. The parsnip, I wasn't sure about. Look how hard this is. It's quite interesting, quite an interesting texture. So let's see what happens. I don't think this is going to work. I think my trial is uh, botched. Pureed parsnip got really hard, just like garlic does. We'll see. I'll try to pulse it and see what happens. So once I got all this really hard pureed parsnip all pulsed and uh, powdered up, I started putting it in a jar for storage, just like I do with most of my freeze dried goods. All right, so that's what we got out of those parsnips. It actually powdered up not too bad. I don't know though, it was pretty, pretty solid. I don't think this is like the best preservation method but we're gonna try to rehydrate just a little bit to 
just to see what the texture is like. So I'm just going to try just a little bit like that. I'll get some hot water. Now the one thing I actually did not do to know how much water to add back to it, I should have done before and after weights, but I did not. But this is all learning. I, I'm not an expert at the freeze dryer either. I'm just experimenting to see, you know, what I can get it to do for me, basically. Oh, it smells very parsnipy. There's some bigger chunks in there, so I'm not sure how well they'll rehydrate. Hmm. I'm just gonna let that sit for a minute or two. I probably could add a smidgen more water, actually. All right, I'm just gonna let that sit for a minute or two. All right, here's my pureed parsnip. Now I didn't add any milk or cream or butter or anything to this, just leaving it sort of as is, just to see what the texture's like. like parsnip. It's kind of, um, it's got a very good parsnip flavor. It's just kind of thick. I actually think if I whip this with a bit of cream, I don't have any cream, I don't think. Maybe a little drop of butter we're going to try. All right, I got a little tiny bit of butter. Don't know if this parsnip is warm enough to melt the butter now at this point. But we'll see. I'm just going to throw a smidgen of milk in. I don't have cream. Normally we would do like a thick, like a heavy whipping cream or something in this. All right, so I have just a tiny bit of butter and a tiny bit of milk added to it. It's pretty good. It really is. I'm actually shocked because I totally thought this was not going to be any good at all when I pulled it out of the freeze dryer and... Um, kind of saw how hard it was. It got almost the really hard like garlic does. Garlic does the same thing, but it's actually like legit, not that bad. I would eat this. I'm eating it now. <laughs> I'm not gonna let it go to waste. It's really not bad. Yeah, I'd say this is like a kind of a win. I, I think I could serve this on a plate. I'd probably put a few herbs or something in it as well. Um, yeah, especially if I rehydrated a bunch and actually used some cream and some butter and used the immersion blender and really whipped it up, which is what I normally do with a pureed parsnip. Um, I'm taking credit for that, but which is what my husband normally does for a pureed parsnip. So he typically does this, but yeah, it's not bad. So that's it. That's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed the video today. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, we'll see you again on the next one. Take care. Bye.